greetings to colleagues in Argentina, all the way from the other side of the planet in India, and I hope all of you are doing well. So I'm about to give you a two-part presentation on innovation policies and technological change. The first part will provide a conceptual overview of how to think about innovation policies and technological change, while the second part will provide certain empirical evidence drawn from much of what is called the global south and specifically from India to understand how the nature of our understanding of innovation and technological change is actually undergoing certain kinds of transformations as the, uh, you know, the scale and scope of these phenomena uh, are changing. Okay? So, on that note, let's start. Now, if you go back almost 30 years ago, uh, it was a momentous time when the Berlin Wall fell, right? And uh, it was at that time when Francis Fukuyama, a professor at George Mason University in Washington, D.C., in the United States, provocatively proposed and argued that we were at the end of history. That is, the end of history to Fukuyama essentially meant the triumph of Western liberal democracy uh, and representative government, capitalist free markets, and the consumerist culture. Right? So this was, in a sense, what Fukuyama was arguing for. Now, in some sense, what Fukuyama was saying was not really new. Because there's actually been a history, at least in the last uh, two centuries, of the proclamation of the end of history, right? For instance, if you go back to Malthus in the early 19th century, uh, you know, he was uh, a British economist who spoke of how population would grow in geometric proportion and therefore outpace uh, growth in agricultural output, which would grow in arithmetic proportion, right? In other words, population growth would be far more rapid than agricultural growth, and he was actually foreseeing mass starvation. Another person who sort of saw the end of history in very different terms in the 19th century was Marx, who thought that capitalism would be overthrown through class struggle, because of the in inherent inequities of capitalism that he wrote about. And that would lay the ground for creating an ideal socialist society. Right? Now, whether it is the views of Fukuyama or Marx or Malthus, the end of history hasn't really happened, in part because, you know, you see the spread of growing spread of nationalism and authoritarian regimes which really challenges, you know, claims about the, uh, you know, and the, the sustenance of liberal democracy. And you also see the erosion of faith in capitalism itself, right, with growing inequality and inequity. So it's not that capitalism is going to be embraced very easily like Mr. Fukuyama had predicted. So w what we're seeing is that the prediction of historical trajectories is not as simple as might seem at first instance. Now, in other words, despite sort of what Marx said, I mean, while Fukuyama has been proven wrong, clearly, and Marx too, but the, one of the reasons why Marx has proven wrong is that, you know, we, despite all the experiments with socialism, for instance, in the former USSR, or in a different manner in China or in Cuba, capitalism clearly is the dominant mode of production despite the inequities and inequalities that result in our continued pursuit. Now, Malthus was also proven wrong 
because agricultural production has increased tremendously, right? Uh, for instance, you had the Green Revolution in the 1960s and 1970s, which ensured that many parts of the world that were facing starvation now increasingly had at least some access to food, even though we continue to live in a world where access to food is uneven. But the predictions of mass starvation have not proven to be valid. Now, interestingly, by 2002, Fukuyama himself had sort of changed his position and he argued in a book that, he came, that, that came out in the year that, the, that there could be no end of history as long as science and technology keep advancing. And he also argued that the fate of societies will actually be determined by the diverse deployments of these technologies. In other words, you have a set or a family of technologies and different societies will learn to deploy them in different ways and that is what is going to determine their fate. There will be no universal convergence of history. And in fact, in the second part of the presentation, we will look at the deployment of technologies in what is generally called the Global South and in India in specifically to understand how trajectories are actually being shaped as are the fates of societies. Now, it is this sort of new technologies and the deployment, that is innovation and the supporting policies that have proven Malthus and Marx wrong, right? Now, historically, if you look at it, it is the desire to improve aggregate productivity and standards of living that leads us to adopt uh, technology and to innovate. Because we are not doing it for its own sake. Unless we see notable changes in our standards of living, technology is, our adopting technology is fairly meaningless. Now, I think it'll be useful at this point to think of or to use some sort of working definitions at least of what we mean by terms such as science, technology and innovation. Now it is these kinds of definitions that is going to provide us with a conceptual framework to think about what technologies are about or how they can take different forms and how we can come up with policies and how we can collectively as a human race benefit from them. Even if, we, even if the benefits are evident in different ways in different societies. Now science is propositional knowledge. That is, it refers to the know what about natural phenomena and regularities. Simple we now know that our planet revolves around the sun, whereas maybe 500 years ago, they thought it was the other way around. But now, thanks to you know, the development of verifiable scientific propositions, we are able to say that you know, here is something we understand about how our planet behaves. So science is the so-called know what as um, the well-known economic historian, Joel Mokher writes. Now, science can be applied to create instructional or prescriptive knowledge, or what we call know-how. And this is also what we refer to as technology, right? It is the know-how, that is how we translate our scientific understanding into something that can be applied especially to solve certain kinds of problems that we call technology. Now, innovation, on the other hand, encompasses the means by which firms master and get into practice of product designs and manufacturing processes that are new to them, whether or not they are new to the universe or to the nation. So, you have a technology which is then taken by a firm 
and then transformed into a set of product designs or processes okay to generate certain kinds of output that is of commercial value right now this transformation this innovation that is taking that is undertaken by the firm might not be terribly new to you know uh, to, to society but as far as the firm is concerned its unique ability to transform that technology into a product or service is innovation at least as far as they're concerned right thus thus innovation is about the diffusion of technology whether or not such technology is new right and therefore the need for innovation policies in other words even if you say you have advanced technologies right it's of little use if you do not have the ability to transfer that or transform the technology innovatively into products and services that are of commercial or social value in order to facilitate or enable the transformation of technology and the to to sort of generate that ability to innovate in different societies you need innovation policies so that is sort of a way of thinking about the why of innovation policies now the importance of uh, technology and innovation has long been understood in fact even Marx although he saw the oath of capitalism talked about revolutionizing the forces of production the only problem with Marx was he sort of underestimated the power of technology to sustain capitalism it's not that he did not acknowledge the importance of technology and innovation into the 20th century Joseph Schumpeter, right, a very well-known Austrian economist who spent a fair bit of his career at Harvard University in the U.S., refers to the gales of creative destruction. That is, when new technologies, products, and sources of supply and organization commands a decisive cost or quality advantage to strike not at the margins of profit or outputs of existing firms, but at their very foundations and lives. In other words, literally like a gale, it comes and sweeps through, uh, I mean, new technologies or products can sweep through existing ways of doing things. And it tends to be a far superior means of doing things. Okay. Now, while it's nice to talk about revolutionizing the forces of production or gales of creative destruction, to signify the importance of technology and innovation. It was not until Robert Solo, a Nobel Prize winning economist at MIT in the US, until Solo came along, that we were able to quantify or precisely understand the extent to which technology and innovation actually mattered. Right? And what Solo did was that he took the period between 1907 and 1949 in the, U in the US and said, to what extent can the growth in the US economy in this period be attributed to increases in the two major factors of production, that is capital and labor. After doing econometric tests, Okay, Solo said that only 12.5% of the growth in the U.S. economy in that period between 1907 and 1949 was attributable to increases in capital and labor, right? And 87.5% was what he called a statistical residue that at that time people did not know how to explain, but something that we have since come to call technological change. That residue represents technological change. Now, which means, you know, if technology is so critical or technological change is so critical to economic growth, I mean, for the period 1907 to 1949 in the US, I mean, 
it accounted for 87.5% of productivity growth. So obviously it's critical, which means the next question is, how do we go about achieving it? How do we bring it about? Because all of us would like to see that kind of technological change, improvements in productivity, and a rise in the standards of living. So how do we do it? Now, in order to understand, let's turn to the father of modern economics, Adam Smith, right? In his work uh, back in 1776, The Wealth of Nations, Smith sort of came up with this idea of a division of labor. And he sort of elaborated on this idea uh, by using the example of a pin, pin factory and sort of showed how we could potentially understand technological change and innovation. Right. Now, when pin assembly is broken down into a number of steps and assigned to many people, as opposed to pins being made or the entire pin being made by one person, when the manufacture of a pin is broken down into different steps and given to different people, the resulting output per worker is greater than the number of pins that each worker would have produced on their own. In other words, there are productivity improvements. Now, for any given technology of pin, uh, pin manufacture, the design of the pin and breaking its production into steps represents the technical division of labor. In other words, if you are able to break down the production process into 10 steps or 15 steps or whatever, that's called the technical division of labor because that is what the technology will allow you to break down the production process into uh, into you know the, the number of steps now how people with specific specific skills perform specific tasks is what is called the social division of labor this refers to saying, okay, what kind of skill do I have to have in order to perform this task? Now think of a modern, manif uh, modern firm or a company, right? So you have an accountant who does accounting work, somebody on the production line, somebody who's in sales, somebody who's in marketing. Now the fact that you have these kinds of skills that are required means that you have a social division of labor. Then finally, you have what is known as the spatial division of labor, which refers to where design and production actually takes place, right? Is it in India? Is it in Argentina? Within Argentina, is it in Buenos Aires or is it in Rafaela? Where it is, you know, what, you know, it's possible that some steps in production take place in one city, other steps in the production takes place in another, and that is what we refer to as the spatial division of labor. Now, we turn to sort of thinking about how to promote technology and innovation with this little background of what Smith tells us. Now, technology itself can come from the application of science to create new products and services, right? We do science, but science is relatively abstract knowledge, but then you have to convert it into the know-how, right? And innovation is what sort of is that which brings about changes in the division of labor, the technical along with the social and spatial, irrespective of new technology, right? So whether or not new, you have new technology, when you say you're innovating, consciously or unconsciously, you start to bring about changes in the division of labor, at least in the social and spatial. You might say, oh, you know, I get better skills, to innovate uh, in another part of the country. So I go there. So that automatically means you're searching for new skills in a different part. Therefore, there's simultaneous uh, change in the social and spatial division of labor, even if there is no change in the technical division of labor. Thus, if you want to foster innovation, it requires uh, generating new technology by applying science. 
nurturing relevant skills to work with and find application for new technologies. Encouraging the growth of new organizations to bring together new technologies and relevant skills. So you might have a large vertically integrated company in some cases, whereas if you want to sort of work with new technologies or sort of innovate even with existing technologies for new applications, you might prefer a startup, for instance. So you have new organizational forms that may be required. You then have to identify places with the social and political circumstance to support our firms and new institutional actors so that they can come together productively, right? So some locations find a, a supporting sort of political environment where the politicians, the bureaucrats are saying, no, we'll help you. Others are less so. So then you have to find those kinds of locations to innovate. And finally, you are also trying to, you also need to create new markets because even if you come up with wonderful products, if nobody sees the value, then commercially you can't go very far. Thus, the division of labor is also limited by the extent of the market. In other words, even if productivity improves, if you can't sell it, then improving productivity by changing division of labor is pretty pointless. Now, since innovation, you know, uh, depends on many factors, I mean, you could do one of many things that we talked about or that were listed in the previous slide, but uh, what it also sort of points to that innovation depends on many factors and that the full um, extent of productive improvements as a result are not immediately apparent after either of the after introduction of a new technology either at a social or a firm level so what happens is that because it's a messy process you're trying to figure out new technologies who are the kinds of people who can work with it where is it that you can best get the work done how do you create markets and so on it's not a simple process so it actually takes time right that's that's what we're referring to indeed uh, again, if you go back to uh, into history, uh, after the development of the dynamo in the, 19, a, a, the 1880s, it took until the 1920s to fully understand how to reorganize workflows when substituting electric power for older sources of energy such as steam. So if you go to factories in the 1880s, before there was widespread electricity um, uh, you know, generation and transmission, most factories were organized using steam power. Now that required a certain kind of logic and layout in the factories. But with the coming of electricity, the nature of machinery changed, the locational requirements changed because you no longer had to be next to say a canal, okay, to, to, to turn a, a, a water turbine. So, but it took people a while to actually figure out how to depreciate older machinery, how to incorporate machinery with electric technology into their workflow and what that might mean for production and productivity. Coming to more recent times, uh, Robert Solow, the same economist we referred to earlier, talked about the productivity paradox. In fact, when the computers first started to make an appearance from the late 70s, early 80s, uh, and after especially the arrival of the PC. Um, Solo wrote, you know, we see the computer everywhere on, you know, uh, on desks at homes and offices and in hospitals and universities and so on. We see the computer everywhere, but in the productivity statistics, right? The data doesn't seem to reflect our adoption of technology. Now this sort of paradox reflects the systemic nature of many technologies and the need for complementary investments and intangible and often hard to measure organizational changes, right? Now, let's talk about complementary investment first and then we talk about hard to measure organizational changes. For instance, if you see, if you can think about a simple example like the, uh, the, the, the car, we can't think of the car or the automobile without having complementary investments in things like uh, gasoline stations, right? 
just like today we are saying electric vehicles will not be widespread and will not find easy adoption unless we are able to set up charging stations so that the batteries can be charged right so that's a complementary investment and those investment will not appear magically but will take time think about organizational changes right so when the computer first came or before the computer first came in many offices or in most offices you had a large pool of typists who type letters but with the computer appearing on virtually everybody's desk that segment of the workforce disappeared right and in an earlier generation when electricity first came you know or before electricity came factories would end their work day when it became dark but once electricity was made available you could actually work 24 hours right so these are organizational changes that we start to think about and whose potentials we start to understand and that understanding takes time for firms managerial choices the nature of knowledge intellectual property protection and the asset structure of the firm impact the business enterprise's ability to capture value from innovation in other words you got to figure out what kinds of decisions to make with new innovations how do you protect intellectual property okay what is now an important asset what is not in the earlier days typewriters might have been useful assets they no longer are right and even now given the pace at which technologies are changing even a you know a 6 month old laptop um, or a computer is not necessarily a very valuable asset so our conceptualization of what it is that sort of uh, forms the basis uh, for for production productivity etc has to change and it takes time right so that is why um, solo pointed out to the productivity paradox now another way of sort of representing the productivity paradox is to think in terms of what is called the diffusion right now uh, everett rogers who was a, a a a thinker and scholar of innovation many years ago came up with this very famous s curve right so what he said was that typically i know he studied the, the diffusion of a number of technologies especially in the us and he said typically for any new technology you have a set of early adopters right sorry about that you have a set of early adopters and they sort of are the ones who are actually trying and testing what the technology is capable of once their ability to sort of work with these things becomes more well known then the shape of the curve becomes like a steep you know it it becomes very steep in the initial initially it rises very slowly whether it's this technology or this or this right or, or, or innovation once a certain point is reached the adoption of the technology or the diffusion of the innovation becomes very rapid right this is when what he refers to as take off and then once it reaches a certain point when a large number of sort of potential users have, have started using it then it starts to taper off when you have late adopters who typically move in and um, you know that's when it sort of the curve starts to flatten right now this is typically a sort of a, a, a or a, a a stylized model of how innovation takes place and here is an instance or here is an illustration of its uh, of how different technologies diffuse through the us in the 20th century so you can see that they are sort of more or less s curves they are not precise s curves uh, in some cases for instance you take radio it took a much longer time to diffuse whereas if you take the case of tvs you see that between 1945 and about 1916 a period of 15 years uh, more than 80% of the american population had television access to television sets and since the 1990s you also see the internet sort of 
growing quite sharply, right? The diffusion of the internet. Okay. Now, you remember that I had earlier mentioned that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. Now, what we will do in the next few slides is to start to think about how is it that over the last 200 to 250 years, we managed on one hand to develop new technologies, innovations, and at the same time managed to create a market so that supply side forces and demand side forces could actually intersect to ensure that there was significant advances in sort of productivity and uh, standards of living. Of course, let me emphasize that this was not uniform all over the world, but at least in some pockets, right? You witness a very sharp increase in standards of living. And overall, if you see in the last two to 300 years, or at least since the Industrial Revolution, the increase in standards of living have been historically unparalleled, and especially in the 20th century. So it's sort of just useful to understand why is it that in human history, which is at least 5,000 years old, the last 200 years have been especially unique or special, right? Now, until the year about 1400, right, the, the, the 15th century, China was the world's technological leader, right? And it had developed technologies like gunpowder and printing and silks and so on and so forth. But with the advent of modern science following European enlightenment, leadership gradually shifted to the West, right? And I mean Europe. And in Europe, at the same time, there was a major sort of an organizational shift within society as feudal societies in, um, in, um, um, in Europe started to break down, you started to witness the rise of absolutist monarchies, a feudalism as the dominant mode of production started to give way to capitalism and it laid the sort of the institutional foundation or what we now refer to as the first industrial revolution. And this happened in the late 18th century. At that time, the first industrial revolution was centered around Britain, uh, especially in northern England, around the you know, cities like Manchester and Leeds. And the uh, sort of the primary technology was sort of steam power uh, with new technologies that also developed around steam power such as textile machinery, railways and telegraph. And at that time, you know, these technologies, their sort of new products were all developed not by using anything that we might now call modern science, right? Most of it was done through trial and error, right? So you hear of James Watt, what watching the kettle boil and saying, oh, you know, I now have understood something about how steam power works. Okay. But this is sort of the era when we started to rely on science and that became a basis for new technologies centered, like I said, on steam power and a whole new set of products such as textile machinery and so on. You also saw craft production replacing, uh, being replaced with mass production. So where you would previously produce uh, only sort of small numbers for typically for a wealthy elite or the royal court, you suddenly, because of the availability of machinery and a major source of energy in the form of steam power, you had mass production that became possible. But this raised the question, if mass production becomes possible, okay, it will demand large quantities of raw materials and it will also demand mass markets for its valorization. You have to sell what you're producing. Now, for the first industrial revolution, the answer to these 
challenges. That is of finding vast quantities of raw material and finding mass markets for valorization, the answer was actually colonialism, right? And the non-capitalist world was brought under capitalist relations of production to serve as new sources of uh, material and as markets. Uh, as Lenin famously wrote, imperialism represented the highest form of capitalism, right? So you see, for example, the British went and conquered most of the world. They had cotton coming in from places as far as Virginia in the southern US to Egypt to India and uh, you know, in their, uh, and, and their vast colonies, right, uh, which spanned the entire globe, also served as markets for many of the products that were emerging from the textile mills of Lancashire or from the manufacturing uh, plants uh, in the English Midlands, right? Now, the first industrial revolution, right, started to sort of lose steam, literally, by the, uh, uh, by the late 19th century. Uh, and one of the reasons was that, you know, colonialism was, was no longer able to provide the answer to markets, because by the late 19th century, and you all know this well, Latin America became increasingly sort of, you know, was willing to say goodbye and become independent. And there was also another set of reasons. And this had to do with the fact that around that time, the late 19th, early, uh, late 19th, early 20th centuries, you had a whole new generation of sort of technologies and innovations. The, you had the availability of a new source of power, which is electricity, which I mentioned earlier. And you had a whole slew of products, right? The internal combustion engine, uh, you know, flight, and the Wright brothers, for instance, chemicals. And most of these, very different from the first industrial revolution, were developed with the formal application of science in industrial laboratories. So for instance, you had um, General Electric setting up its labs in Schenectady in upstate New York, you know, and you had uh, Philips setting up its labs in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, Siemens in Berlin, and so on and so forth, where there was an increasingly granular social division of labor because now with increasing availability of science and, and forming the basis for technologies, you needed to have chemists and physicists and all kinds of specialized people to work with the emerging knowledge to produce new products and, uh, and, and services. Now the institutional configuration also, also started to change with Fordism right, to, uh, to, to support markets for virtu virtu virti vertically integrated production facilities with tripartite national agreements between capital, labor, and state. Now, what does this mean, right? Like I said, colonialism had given way, but now you had gener the sort of the generation of new markets left to this sort of phenomenon that we refer to as Fordism, okay? Now, Fordism was this tripartite agreement between capital, labor and the state. Very simply put, capital was given control of work processes for productivity gains. So they figured out how to arrange plants, manufacturing plants, how to arrange the, the production facilities and so on. Labor for its part was guaranteed wage increases, right? And that ensured sustained demand because if uh, you know, if labor was paid well, they would go out and buy all the consumer goods or the goods that the factories are producing. In fact, the name Fordism itself comes to the fact that Henry Ford, of uh, the, the founder of Ford Motor Company, caused quite a scandal back in about a century ago when he gave the first $5 a day wage when the prevailing wage rate was barely half of that at that time. Ford argued that unless his workers were well paid, there would be no market for his cars. Now the state mediated between labor, labor and capital to balance productivity gains and wage demands in the sense that they would play the sort of the, the judge to saying, okay, are your demands for productivity increases fair? And then it could tell labor, okay, based on these productivity improvements, 
are your demands for wage increases fair, right? Now the state also supplied public goods such as education and health to ensure productivity increases. Because on one hand, like I said, with the formal application of science, you needed to have better skilled population. You needed to have well-trained people. And you started to see, therefore, uh, you know, the growth of university education on a large scale. Right? It was no longer just an elite preoccupation. Right? Um, and at the same time, you needed to also have better health facilities because um, like, you know, people like Charles Dickens and others wrote famously, the first industrial revolution took place in absolutely appalling conditions where, you know, longevity was very limited and one simply didn't know if a worker left for home, whether he or she would return the next morning alive to work as productively the next day. So you needed to have health uh, facilities in the form of public health. Urban planning started to play a big role, right? to have hygienic sort of living conditions and so on. And all of this was provided by the state because it was sort of collective or, or public goods and to ensure public welfare. And that's partly where the name welfare state comes. Okay. But so the, this sort of the second revolution, industrial revolution, along with its technologies, goods and services, sort of chugged along very well till about the 1970s. When again markets started saturating because the second industrial gener uh, revolution generate a whole, uh, generated a whole series of products like automobiles and washing machines and, uh, and so on. But let's face it, right? Especially in, in the wealthy world and anywhere, I suppose, you can maybe have two washing machines or three. You will not likely have 25 washing machines at home. So over a period of time, in increasingly in many societies, these products were saturated and the S curve had sort of flattened out, right? And the 1970s also were witness to sort of sluggish economic growth. And uh, there was the first oil crisis, and, uh, which, which essentially meant that the combination of, you know, uh, of, of saturated markets with rising energy prices and so on, it meant that there was something that was that needed to be done to sort of increase momentum in terms of economic growth, or things would become very slack. In fact, there was a lot of clash, especially in Europe and North America at that time, between labor and capital, simply because capital was not able to sort of generate adequate productivity improvements because markets had saturated. But labor kept saying, you know, that's not our problem. We need higher wages, right? And so this led to a number of strikes in that period. It was generally a very difficult decade for the, from an economic point of view. But while all this was sort of going on, the, what you might call the seeds of the germ for the third industrial revolution were being quietly laid, right? And those seeds had been planted back in 1949, right? In, with the development of the transistor at uh, AT&T Bell Labs in, uh, in, in New Jersey, uh, in the United States, uh, which was followed by the microprocessor in 1971, the personal computer in the late 1970s, and the commercialization of the internet in 1993. In other words, you were seeing this technological rejuvenation driven by microelectronics, which people, nobody had really anticipated. So despite the 70s, the troubles in the 1970s, no one knew that there was this big storm, this wave of sort of, uh, you know, creative destruction that Schumpeter talked about was about to sweep through our our entire planet and completely change uh, how we do things, right? So what it did was that you had increasingly powerful, affordable and general purpose information and communication technologies find applications in diverse domains such as banking, governance or healthcare. In other words, 
this technology, ICTs or IT if you prefer, started was not just a technology in itself, but like electricity in the earlier generation or, or, in, or uh, steam power in the first industrial revolution, it was a general purpose technology, which by which we mean it finds application in various areas. So whether you're in a classroom today, or whether you're in a hospital, or whether you go to a government office, you see computers everywhere. You have things like e-governance and you know uh, electronic records, and you have uh, uh, you know the integration of manufacturing, production, workflows. None of which would be possible but for ICTs, right? So you see this fundamental sort of transformation that is taking place. Institutionally, you also had in the 1980s something called the Washington Consensus, which started to emphasize and, and sort of give great importance to free markets, private property, and individual incentives. And it also sort of pushed for easier capital flows, and it enshrined a liberal trade regime in the form of the World Trade Organization. Essentially, the Washington Consensus, by which we mean the consensus reached between three key institutions in Washington, D.C., the IMF, the World Bank, and the U.S. Treasury, institutions <coughs> which people like you in Argentina and like us in India are very familiar with uh, for the work that they do, for better or worse, uh, they started to sort of emphasize, you know, uh, you know, saying we have to free up the markets, that's the only way we're going to transform the economic stagnation of the 1970s, we need greater sort of capital flows, foreign direct investment, etc. Now, interestingly, that, you know, the, 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 the goals of the WTO, like sort of capital flows and, and free markets, were really would not have been easy, but for the fact that they could be facilitated by ICTs, right? So in other words, what ICTs did was they connected the entire sort of planet right and it was managed to, and it sort of managed to create a new global economy that worked as a single unit in real time on planetary scale right so in other words if you bought a t-shirt from benetton in rafala okay immediately it that is noted in the benetton headquarters in italy and then probably some factory in malaysia or china or india is told saying, oh, size maybe, you know, X uh, in color, red color has to be, you know, one of them was sold, so we need to sort of fulfill inventory. So that's sort of, you know, the flow of ideas, the capital, everything sort of at work for you, thanks, and thanks mostly to ICTs. So the new institutional regime and technology reinforced one another. Right? Now, the new, uh, the, the epicenter, of the third industrial revolution was of course Silicon Valley, right? Now, the <clears throat> third industrial revolution brought about certain new characteristics which we had not seen earlier, right? And the primary characteristic was blurred boundaries. In other words, this meant flat hierarchies of firms, very blurred boundaries between firms rather than saying this is, you know, rather than operating in silos and relationships between firms and other institutions in the region in Silicon Valley. So you have very close relationships between the university, uh, between firms in the valley and universities such as Stanford, the University of California, Berkeley, and other, mem other sort of players in the ecosystem like, you know, venture capitalists, IP lawyers, and so on. And they all sort of in interact with one another constantly. Now, blurred boundaries have created a relatively free flow of ideas, often informal, uh, between a technical community of researchers who identify as much with the profession as with any firm in the region. That is, I take great pride in being a computer scientist uh, or an electrical engineer as a uh, and not just working for company X or Y, right? So there's a professional identity and pride, and that allows this community to e exist despite the competition between the firms, right? Sharing among a vertically decentralized network of firms allows the region to collectively define new technologies. 
by drawing on the science from the universities. And what happens is the protocols, the standards to which new technologies have to work are often defined in Silicon Valley in conjunction with the science that is generated at the universities. In other words, they are defining the new technologies, right, collectively. And then each firm takes it upon itself to innovate and generate specific products and services based on technologies that they are defining as an industry collectively, the science for which comes from the university. Now, despite a global economy, presence in Silicon Valley is an asset thanks to mentoring, right? So you learn from one another. Now, presence in Silicon Valley hardly guarantees success, right? Going there doesn't mean your firm will be successful, but it makes success more likely because you are in the middle of things, developments, and you can pick up on new trends and so on, rather than sitting in some other corner of the world where you may not read it you know, after things have happened. Now, so, when I say blurred boundaries and the sharing of ideas, see, until the second industrial revolution, you had what you might refer to as a closed paradigm of industrial R&D, right? So, essentially, you have research and then you have development, right? Research, you develop the technology, uh, where you identify the technologies, perfect the technologies, and in development, you actually innovate to create products and services for the market, right? But the firm itself is like a hard line. In other words, all the research takes a place within the firm. Uh, they take a number of ideas, technologies, and then depending on what the market needs, the funnel narrows on the other side, and a few of those technologies find applications uh, uh, as innovations and products and services, and it goes into the market. But it all takes place within the firm, whether it's the research or the development. But what we're seeing now, and this is what is perfected at Silicon Valley, which makes the region so interesting, is that you have an open innovation paradigm. In other words, you do have research, you do have development, and you, uh, but what is happening is, as the boundaries of the firm becomes blurred, you see firms are saying, it's not that we're going to do everything within our boundaries. We'll borrow ideas from outside, right? Likewise, uh, we will also take ideas from outside in order to innovate. It all doesn't come to have to come from our own research. And some of the research in our firm can also be taken and adopted by other firms to generate their own products and services, right? So the advantage of this, or what this acknowledges, is that no one firm has everything or all the knowledge that it takes to develop new technologies and to innovate, right? And we work very well when we do so collectively, and we can do that without sacrificing our individual interests and incentives. So this is a better representation of how Silicon Valley works rather than the uh, old sort of closed industrial model. So yeah, so the, the, the contrasting principles of closed and open innovation. Closed innovation, the smart people in our field work for us. Whereas in open innovation, not everybody who's smart works for us. We need to work with smart people inside and outside our company, right? And then to profit from R&D, we must discover it, develop it, and ship it ourselves. In the open innovation model, it says external R&D can be significant, right? Internal R&D is needed to claim some portion of that value. If we discard it ourselves, we will get to it, to get to the market first. Now, that's the original idea, but now we're saying we don't have to originate the research to profit from it. Somebody else can do the research. We can benefit from it, just like somebody may profit from our research. That's okay. The company that gets an innovation to market will, win, will first will win. But the current thinking is building a better business model is better than getting to market first. Right? You, you have to understand your market and you need to build a business model that goes around it rather than simply saying here's a set of products and services that people may not want. Then the old idea was if we create the most and the best ideas in the industry, we will win. The new way of thinking about it is if we make the best use of internal and external ideas, we will win. Right? So it's not just our own ideas but everybody's. 
Finally, we should control our IP so that competitors don't profit from ideas. On the other hand, we now say we should profit from others use of our IP. That's okay. We should buy others IP when we don't have it. Even as long as it advances our business model. So it's a much more pragmatic approach to deciding or saying what is mine or yours, right? Now, part of the sort of the uh, reason for this sort of change in our approach to innovation and is, uh, you know, can be traced back at least to uh, 1969, right? Which is a landmark year for 20th century technology. Uh, on the 20th of July, of course, the Apollo 11 moon landing by Armstrong and Aldrin. And frankly speaking, despite all the excitement, the romance of going into outer space for the first time, the last manned mission was actually in 1972, on the land manned mission to the moon at least. It was really a project that was developed for the Cold War, a vanity project if you might, to show the other side, hey, you know, we are ahead of you. But these costs became extremely hard to justify and bear, right? Especially with the US involvement in a terrible war in Vietnam where they lost somewhere between 40 and 50,000 lives. So when you're losing a big battle on planet Earth, what are you going and conquering outer space for? But even as that was happening, there's something else that was, nobody sort of paid any attention to in 1969, which has had a far more transformative effect on our lives than going to the moon, right? And that was at AT&T Bell Labs, again, the same place where 20 years ago, the transistor had been developed. Uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie began to develop Unix, a multi-user operating system. Unix use spread rapidly as AT&T's liberal licensing to universities, open innovation at work here, led to the collaborative development of a truly open system. Example, the Berkeley Software Distribution, or BSD. Because of AT&T's liberal distribution of uh, Unix, Unix soon became the most influential operating system as its various versions, including Linux, right, has become the worst, most widely adopted by the world's leading computer vendors. So you see, it's played an extremely important role in the advancement of the computing industry, thanks to the AT&T saying, you know, we let ideas go. And AT&T has also benefited. Uh, and there was another event also in 1969, which has had a very, very profound impact on our lives. And that was in September 1969, the birth of the internet with the first internet message processor, what we now call a router, that was delivered by the Boston firm, Bolt Baranek Newman, to the lab of Professor Leonard Kleinrock uh, at UCLA in Los Angeles. The first message to pass over the internet was from here. That is on October 29th, 1969. Here you see Professor Leonard Kleinrock standing next to the first router. Now, why is this important? Although this was funded, uh, the development of the router and the sort of the internet was founded by the Defense Advanced uh, Projects Research Agency or DARPA as it's known in the US. Diffusion of the internet became, uh, you know, was possible because the technologies were developed by a network of university students who later became the foremost networking experts, right? So among uh, um, uh, Leonard Kleinrock students are people like Winton Cerf, who is now uh, the chief technology evangelist at Google, for instance, right? So the reason why the internet spread was because the, was DARPA allowed the ideas to be worked on by university students and it was not kept as a secret military project. Ideas flowed around, everybody benefited, including the US military. And even this sort of lecture is being transmitted from Bangalore, India, in large part because we have something on the internet that's available, right? Now, you have what you might think of as the ultimate sort of open innovation. You have open source, uh, uh, you know, you have open source software, etc. To open source, you know, even dr drugs are made or, or uh, medicines are made through open source mechanisms these days. 
Now, in area of software, commercial software typically is released by firms as closed source. In other words, users cannot make use or uh, make changes even if they spot any uh, mistakes, what are called bugs, right, or defects. Now, but the availability of the internet as an electronic public domain allowed users to voluntarily cooperate to develop an open source alternative where the source code is released with the software for anyone to use, modify and redistribute. So for instance, if you take Linux, right, Linux has sort of increasingly become the dominant operating system, right? Why? Because with Linux, people are saying, I, you know, if the, if the software that doesn't work, I can actually, with a little bit of knowledge, go in and make changes and fix the software. Now, public domain software is likely to be used in various ways by different users. If functional enhancements are required or if bugs are noticed, even a technologically ignorant person can call the attention of the project community and hope that someone capable will find the problem interestingly enough to solve, thereby benefiting everyone. Open source development is a decentralized process, right? Uh, like a bazaar. It's not like a firm at all, where there's somebody, some CEO giving the orders. It's like a bazaar where many voices and agendas are pursued, right? Now, contrast to development within a firm that is akin to cathedral building using a unique top-down master plan. Now, with this, we come to the first half of our discussion of uh, innovation uh, policies and technological change. Um, uh, just like I said, it was just meant to give you a broad conceptual historical overview of how we think about this phenomenon. And we can now move on to the second part, right? Okay. All right. So thank you. Uh, let's move on to the second part. I'll take a short water break and uh, I'm also told that uh, uh, by Andrea that we will have an opportunity to discuss some of these ideas uh, and focus uh, more closely on the Indian case. I'll take a number of examples from India uh, in part because I've done a lot of my research here, but I think it's also because it has relevance to many other parts of the world. Now, while these major sort of the industrial revolutions were going on in the uh, world, most of them happened to be uh, centered around North America, Western Europe, and Japan, right? Now, in the global south, now when I say global south, I'm leaving out anything but North America, Western Europe, and Japan is global south. Now, what happened was that in, uh, in the World War II era, or soon after World War II, uh, many of these sort of former colonies, especially in Asia and Africa, became independent, and they started to embrace what is called import substitution industrialization, right? They wanted to free themselves from their colonial masters by adopting a topic that is inward looking, public sector led as opposed to private sector driven uh, uh, industrialization policies. And these are based either on sort of backward integration. In other words, you start making consumer goods and then you gradually build the equipment that makes these final consumer goods, right? That is the process that was adopted in Latin America or you go through a process of forward integration by starting with capital goods. In India, for instance, we did the, we took the sort of the, the, the opposite route. We said, let's first learn how to build the capital goods. That is the machinery that will make machinery that will finally make consumer goods rather than starting with consumer goods and then making the heavy machinery finally. But irrespective of the trajectory that was followed or the route that was followed, most of these efforts really came to naught uh, because there were sort of significant limits in terms of developing technology or innovating locally. Of course, there were a few exceptions, uh, uh, such as Embraer in, in Brazil or India's generic pharma industry, which is the largest in the world. And a big part of the problem was, of course, because 
you had very limited markets, right? The local purchasing power was limited, and furthermore, because of very inward-looking policies, you were also not keen to or able to export. And over a time, because what you were making was also not very technological advanced, it became even more hard to, ex to sort of go into the global market and compete with the most advanced products in the world, whether it came from Europe or from Japan or from North America. So what happened tragically was that many continue, uh, countries continued to remain sources of raw material or they only joined what became known as a new international division of labor on the basis of low cost manufacturing. Okay. Essentially, uh, most of the technology and production knowledge lay with the north, with the global north, and so the best thing that the south could supply was low cost labor. Of course, there were some efforts to break away from this through models such as appropriate technologies that were inspired by uh, Schumacher, who in turn was inspired by Gandhi. And this whole appropriate technology movement de-emphasized automation, they de-emphasized scale and capital intensity, all in favor of locally controlled, decentralized, labor-intensive, energy-efficient technologies. But this didn't really gain a t uh, sort of acceptance because of limited technical transferability, weak institutional support, and, inst and insufficient funding. There was not enough money going to these efforts. There was not enough documentation, IP protection, etc., to be able to say, okay, let's scale. You know, these technologies are very good. So by the 1980s, this had pretty much died a slow death. But while most the, the story was not particularly cheerful in most parts of the global south, in, in a certain corner of East Asia, there were some very remarkable changes, right? And I refer here to the so-called four tigers, that is Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Singapore, right? And what they did was to undertake this project that has come to be known as late industrialization, okay? A political project where, state, where the state subsidized sectors in which it wanted to build a comparative advantage, right? It said, okay, we're going to sort of focus on a few sectors. It also ensured price distortions by combining financial incentives with tariff protection, right? So what it did was it also said, if you're going to produce domestically, we are going to give ourselves certain financial advantages. So high tariffs, and we're also going to maybe play around with the exchange rates, et cetera, right? The state also curtailed consumption and invested savings to build education system and infrastructure. So all these countries invested heavily in university, you know, building really first-rate universities. And uniquely in the city-states of Singapore and Hong Kong, they also built a wonderful or an, an extensive public housing system, which, uh, you know, even to this day, accommodates at least 70% uh, of the local population. What public housing did was to serve or provide a welfare net to a rapidly growing economy faced with economic uncertainty, right? But here's the difference between say, most of the other countries of the global south and these four tigers. In exchange for subsidies, whether it was like, you know, uh, uh, tariff protection or whether it was, you know, distorted exchange rates, the Korean state, for instance, imposed industry performance standards in the form of export targets. In other words, we'll give you a whole bunch of benefits, but go forth and conquer the world, right? We'll help you build a steel industry or a car industry or a textile industry, but you have to go and sell internationally. Don't just focus on the domestic market because in any case, that market has been very strongly curtailed, right? So what firms did in response was use subsidies to import technology and use it efficiently by world standards in large production facilities to exploit economies of scale and to reverse engineering products and processes. This became known as industrialization by learning. Thus, import the technology, figure out why it works, okay, and then sort of build that, and, and build manufacturing facilities 
uh, to ensure that you're able to sort of not just replicate the technology but also improve on it right and build it at such a scale so that your costs of production are brought down very significantly thus you know you take for example in south korea you have the you know posco uh, pohang an and steel became one of these sort of the the most sort of cost efficient sort of steel producer in the world and later you have taiwanese firms becoming some of the most um, you know innovative and low cost semiconductor producer in the, producers in the world all by forming by sort of following the same sort of broad principle right okay now it's the ability to deploy relatively low wage but increasingly well educated labor made that made possible shop floor learning and efficient production to help export a range of low cost products that relied on borrowed, borrowed technology now this is a classic instance so where you have technology that is hardly new the technology was actually worked out very well in europe north america or japan you import the technology but where is the innovation taking place the innovation is taking place in figuring out how to make those products how to make a new set of products using existing technology differently how to organize the firms differently by in much larger production facilities than the world had seen right and you use low cost labor you use very very well educated labor and then you're able to tell the world i will be able to give you something that is reasonably new as an innovative product for example a safer car right or it might be a steel of a particular grade or a particular quality right not new technology but a certainly something that is novel and new right all based on borrowed technology but being sort of organized in a very different fashion it's a new social division of labor and a new spatial division of labor that is forming in east asia now among the sort of the relatively disappointing uh cases in the global south was india right now although india pursued import substitution uh, industrialization after it became independent from the british in the 19 in in 1947 by the 1980s um india realized that policies were not anywhere as effective as those in east asia and increasingly india came under the influence of the washington consensus that is the imf the world bank and the american sort of treasury and many, and and sort of embraced liberal economic policies right uh and in this sense you know india was not really much of an exception right there were many countries who by the 70s especially when there was a sort of a global slowdown in the economy were also affected and like india they had to go for sort of a bailout to the IMF and the World Bank and say can you help us right we are broke we don't know what we can do to get out of this mess and the IMF said okay here's what you do free markets greater foreign investment liberalize your uh, economies and so on so in india an early step that was taken was to modernize a telecommunication infrastructure that was characterized by very poor quality very low ten, uh, telephone density and you know at that time i remember when i was growing up even in the in the 70s and even up to the early 80s it would take you 10 years before you got a telephone connection from the state uh, uh, telecoms company so which is like you know 10 years is 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 a, is a is a fair fair bit of time and the quality of course is just terrible even so making so you wonder what you're really waiting for but what did happen from the from about 84 85 was that reform undertaken with an expatriate indian right a person here you know who had worked in the us uh, he returned after years to establish what became known as the center for development of telematics to develop telephone switching equipment suited to indian conditions high call rates high call volume per line high sort of temperature dust and humidity because much of the dominant technology in in telephone switching until that time was largely sort of stuff that had come out of europe or north america where you did not have tropical temperatures you know in india the top temperatures can go up to 45 46 in the summers humidity is very high it's 98% plus in most of the uh, uh country in the summers particularly and is very dusty 
right? So you don't find much of these conditions uh, in places like Sweden, where Ericsson comes from, or uh, Alcatel, where France comes from, right? Um, uh, yeah. So Pit, Pit, what Sam Petroda, that's the name of the guy who returned to the country, did was to lead the development of technologies with domestic skills, and also conceived of an innovation to improve telephone access by redefining it in terms of distance from a phone rather than in phones per thousand population. Now, typically, when people talk about telephone density, people say, okay, how many uh, phones do you have per thousand population? Now, Petroda said, given the size of India, I mean, today we are a country of 1.2 billion people, but back then, even then, we were about 700 million people in the uh, seven to 800 million people in 84, 85. And he said, you're not going to get anywhere near the rates of the advanced industrial countries, but let's rethink, right? And here's where innovation comes in, about how we think about telephone density. If we have to get telephones to people, let's think of it in terms of distance from a telephone rather than density, right? Now, what this meant, it eventually led to the opening up of the telecommunications market. And today, India has the second largest mobile phone subscriber base in the world, right? So, I mean, they're close to a billion uh, mobile phones and subscribers in the country. Now, how did that happen, right? To go back to, uh, to what Petroda did uh, to, in terms of redefining sort of telephone density in terms of distance, Petroda in the, in the late 80s offered sort of about a million franchisee operated public call offices with subscriber trunk dialing, that's domestic long distance calling and international subscriber dialing established across the country. Right now, the phone booths were also equipped with low cost meters. So you see those sort of meters in the on the top about the gentleman standing and making a phone call, a little red uh, uh, a meter, which tells you how many seconds you've been speaking for and below that, how much it is costing. you. So you, let's say you go in with a specific budget. Right? I'll speak for so many dollars or pesos or whatever. And you know exactly, OK, I, I need to convey the message within such and such time. Now, previously we did have telephone booths, but in the absence of these meters, there was always suspicion that the guy who ran the telephone booth was cheating you, right? What Petroda realized was that having these booths, okay, meant it would improve access, but that you also had to convince your users that they were being given a fair deal. That's the thing, that's the, the meters. And these are essentially your cab meters, right, which, which say how many miles you've gone. And essentially, it's a modified version of that, very low cost. And the other thing this did in terms of improving access was essentially if you were, you know, lived reasonably close to a phone booth, uh, you could make friends with the guy and let's say your brother or some family member or friend would call, say, internationally. This guy would tell them, you know, I'll uh, just hang on, I'll, you know, I'll, uh, I, can, I can tell your brother or friend who's here and then call back later. So the information goes to the person for whom the phone call is made to, and then that person comes to the booth, and then the person calls again, and they can talk. So these are sort of informal social arrangements that became possible, and critically, it improved access to telephony. And uh, of course, now with mobile phones in everybody's pocket, these kinds of you know, uh, 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 booths these uh, you know, telephone booths are all gone, right? But nevertheless, they were a very, very important sort of means or an, in both a technological and sort of uh, a, a technological change and a sort of a kind of a social innovation that really revolutionized telecommunications in India. And today, what is happening is that because of the availability of mobile phones, what the regulators are trying to do is saying, let's see how much we can push broadband access. Right? And so to augment the shortage of Wi-Fi hotspots in the country, we have only about 30,000 versus about 10 million in the US. Uh, the Telecom uh, Regulatory Authority of India is opening public data offices by partnering with firms such as the Bangalore startup, which is called Wi-Fi Daba, Wi-Fi Box. Now these hotspots are located at you know, street side tea stalls and tea shops, and they offer very low denomination Wi-Fi coupons starting from about three cents, three American cents, right? So you can buy it and it allows you to download specific amounts of data, right? So for, for, a, for somebody who's not 
having a fixed income because there's a lot of low income people who work in things like construction and other forms of informal labor who do not have a very steady income. For them, this kind of access to data becomes extremely useful and critical, right? So there has been significant sort of innovations that have been taking place in the country around existing technologies. Most of these don't require technological, you know, big new technologies. Around 84, 85, when Petroda was starting to transform telecom, uh, India also sort of started to wake up to the computing industry and its potential. Specifically, um, India wanted to become the software what South Korea and Taiwan were to hardware. And um, the sort of the ICT industry grew by, in India, grew by taking advantage of a large pool of relatively underemployed English speaking and high skilled if low wage scientists and engineers. So we had this sort of pool of really, you know, well trained engineers and scientists. I mean, India produces the second largest number of engineers in the world after China, trained to sort of trained in English. And at the time in the 1980s, because the economy wasn't doing too well, there were not too many of them with the greatest of jobs, right? And India clearly realized that. Taiwan, South Korea, and the East Asia had sort of gone way ahead in the hardware industry. So it said, let's see what we can do with this new thing called software, and let's see if we can take advantage with the skills that we have. So India took advantage of what came to be known as convergence in the ICT industry as the cost and functional characteristics of virtually any application or device is increasingly determined by software. So whether it's a mobile phone or whether it's a CT scan in a hospital, it's the software that is what is most expensive, right? The hardware is playing an increasingly a sort of smaller, uh, accounts for an increasingly smaller proportion of the cost, and most of it is actually software cost. So India said, if software is becoming that important, and that is going to determine the direction the industry is taking, let's go in that direction. That's why 2009-10, India became the largest exporter of information and communication technology services. Today, you know, starting from virtually nothing in um, 1985, in about 35 years, uh, uh, today India exports about 150 or 160 billion dollars of software every year, right? But what happened was, you know, in the early years, in the at least in the late 1980s, uh, software exports are no more than body shopping, right? And by body shopping, essentially, you know, we're referring to a phenomenon of providing inexpensive on-site labor, that is at customer locations, on an hourly basis for low value added programming services such as coding and testing. And this was really, you know, not even exports. A guy would get a order from a client or a customer in the US, a so-called company, he'd come to India, pick up 50 engineers and then send them to the customer site. So it was really labor arbitrage, right? It was not really software development because all of that was being determined by the customer himself. These guys are only supplying bodies. That's the name body shopping. Now what happened was quite often when these engineers went to places like the US or Europe, they realized, these Indian engineers realized that their skills are not being utilized to the best, right? best possible extent. And they quite often therefore simply quit and move on to more challenging and better paying jobs. Because when you went in through the body shopping route, you did not necessarily get a great salary, right? Uh, but so they jumped and they went to work for the Microsofts and the Intels of the world. But the key sort of change came in 1990 with the establishment of what came to be known as software technology parks which offer data communication infrastructure and financial incentives to promote software production and utilization of high skill labor at home instead of at customer sites, right? So what happened was, see in India at that time, like I said in the 1980s still our sort of telecom infrastructure was really shabby, but the software technology parks established, you know, high speed data communication exclusively for the software industry. And the key financial incentive was they said any profits from software exports would be tax exempt. So it was all cream for you, right? So everybody became very, very attractive. 
and because you could now start sort of you had the infrastructure the incentives people started to develop software at home I mean in India so the shift to offshore uh, services in a more liberal economic environment uh, because like I said India had started to sort of adopt the Washington consensus and move to more liberal policies from the 1980s onwards there came uh, this new relationship between the Indian software industry and global markets firms able to keep sort of uh, were able to keep employees under one roof and they pioneered what came to be known as a global offshore delivery model in offshore development centers with the infrastructure technology productivity tools and methodologies of the customer workplace so you had the software technology parks in which firms established themselves and set up all the infrastructure that they needed all the technologies that was needed and said we will do this what they call you know we will do sort of shop, uh, offshore software delivery for customers anywhere in the world right it became a 24 7 uh, method of operation right and there was a very special focus on uh, on, on adopting industry-wide certification norms quality norms uh, specifically the uh, International Standards Organization ISO 9001 9003 standards and the software engineering institutes uh, capability maturity model ISO standards are more popular in Europe the capability maturity model the ACI CMM is more popular in the US so between the ISO and CMM the Indian software industry had covered most of the world's large export markets and indeed by June 2002 85 Indian firms or firms in India were certified at level 5 which is the highest CMM level compared with 42 in the rest of the world put together right so more than like twice the number of firms elsewhere uh, you know you had more than twice the number of firms elsewhere who were certified at level 5 so here's a little map in uh, 1993 we had about half a dozen software technology parks in different parts of the country right uh, Bangalore is, is is right here for those of you who can see it right uh, in the in the southern part of the country but this 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 whole sort of policy initiative proved so popular that by 2015 you had 53 centers throughout the country and you can see it sort of dotting the national landscape right the other thing that happened was that you know till about the 1990s um, India experienced what is called brain drain like some of the best and the brightest would leave to uh, uh, destinations in Europe and US for you know better professional challenges and especially this this sort of accelerated after US uh, immigration laws were changed in 1965 right and in the 1990s however uh, uh, there was another sort of a change in law which 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 accelerated this kind of process of brain drain right what really happened was the US introduced something called the h1b visa which essentially made it possible for people in high skill occupations that were in short supply in the US to be fast tracked through the immigration process essentially right firms could hire people with specialized skills and the, uh, the the people who sort of benefited most out of these were software professionals and most of whom actually came from India and I'll show you the the data very shortly so through the 1990s there was a huge number of Indians who again sort of who went into the US because of the internet boom in 1993 and the sort of the enormous demand for skilled professionals in the US that local universities were alone not able to uh, uh, full, uh, fulfill but what happened was in 2000-2001 you had the great internet bust and uh, at that time you know many kind of these sort of people who had been on h1b visas suddenly found themselves without you know easy employment opportunity in the US and because by that time India's reputation as a provider of software for global markets had grown sufficiently many of those 
who might have stayed back in the US said, let's go back home and let's see if there are better opportunities because people are all but are now starting to talk about it, right? So what it did was to establish greater flows back and forth between India and the US. And the brain drain of the previous 35 years started to become a process of brain circulation as now people started to go more frequently between the US and India. And not just for personal reasons. It was not people coming from the US to visit family. Now they're saying, let me sort of set up operations at a software technology park or something like that and connect to other markets in the US, right? And so you're actually making these sort of trips to also for professional reasons. And in the, in the process, because of your connection in the US, you're also enriching the potential of what Indian skills and Indian firms are able to do. Now, the government, right, uh, uh, the also sort of encouraged these flows with something called the Citizenship Amendment Act in 2005 to create a special category called the Overseas Citizen of India for foreign citizens of Indian origin, people who had taken up American nationality, for instance, and they could now live and work in the country indefinitely. And the only thing they could not do was vote or to sort of hold constitutional offices or buy agricultural property. In any case, what this did do was, uh, you know, create what uh, the great UC Berkeley scholar Annalee Saxidian calls Argonauts, who now brought not just skills, but also knowledge of global markets. Now, access to such embodied knowledge allowed India to build on software services capability to become a global provider of R&D services. And that has been behind much of the growth in information communication technologies over the past 10 years. It's not just the provision of low wage, low cost uh, software services. So here is the, uh, here is a sort of a table that shows you how much India benefited from the uh, H-1B visa, right? Now you see, you just see the worldwide admissions, you see the numbers on the very left, and you see this column here, and you see that India in 1994, 16.2% of the H-1B visas in 94 went to Indians. By 2014, it was 43.4%. And throughout India had the number one rank, right? And when you think about it, and you think that in, uh, in, in uh, 2014, about a half a million H-1B visas were issued, and you say 45% of that, you're actually talking about 250 to 300,000 people who were going. And that's the numbers that were going. And a, big, and, a, and a fair chunk of that actually chose to come home after the uh, internet uh, bust of 2000. And although the numbers continue to grow up, uh, go up, Many of these people who went on H-1B visas also kept their ears very close to what was going on in India. And this whole process of brain circulation continued, right, to the benefit of the country. All right? Okay. Okay. Now, even as this sort of India's sort of software growth was going on, there, there were other sort of, in the early 20th, 21st century, there were other signs that uh, said, you know, that there was more to all of this, okay? Uh, there was sort of growing concern with inequality and collective action problems, such as poverty, climate change, pandemics, you had like the uh, avian flu and all those sorts of things, uh, which led to our collective sort of adoption, first of the Millennium Development Goals and more recently, the Sustainable Development Goals, which we hope to reach by 2030. Now, these are sort of big problems that face the, the planet as a whole and have required significant political action. Now, for firms, especially the large, sort of the most profitable, the biggest multinational companies, they are faced with another challenge, which is very flat population growth and aging populations in the global north, that is uh, in Japan, North America, and Europe, which limit the prop, uh, uh, opportunities for profitability. For instance, Japan today is a, is a country about 120 million people. It's expected to shrink to about uh, 70 million by 2050, right? And the same holds true for uh, you know, Southern Europe uh, and uh, 
uh, even North America and other parts of Europe are not exactly growing at a very rapid rate, right? Attention then immediate at that time slowly started to shift to the global south as markets. Thus far, most of the global south was either, you know, initially, you know, in the early, in, during the colonial days or the days after colonialism was over, even over, the global south merited attention primarily as a source of raw material first and then later on as a site of production with low cost labor and low wage labor, low skill labor, right? But now for the first time, there was now this sudden shift to saying, maybe these guys are global markets too, because the vast majority of the population of the planet actually lives in Asia, Latin America and Africa. And the attention shifted particularly to a segment of the population known as the bottom of the pyramid or the BOP, a, a population that earns say less than $2 a day and whose numbers are estimated at about 4 billion, right, worldwide. Now, obviously given the sort of the affordability of this population, they have very few, inter very few sort of goods and services, they leave, they, they barely have enough to eat. But, uh, and you know, that potentially makes them a large market. Oh, you know, these people don't have anything. Let's give them some really fancy stuff that we are no longer able to sell in say Europe or North America. But that initial optimism died very quickly because the design of products and services for BOP is very demanding, okay? much of this population lives in areas where the physical infrastructure like electricity or roads is extremely unreliable, assuming it even exists. There's of course the problem of disposable income. There is widespread illiteracy, right? People can't necessarily read and write. And of course, you can't talk of this population of 4 billion that's the BOP population as a homogeneous mass. There's enormous uh, socio-cultural diversity. A person who is earning less than two dollars a day in the sort of in in in, in uh, Latin America is hardly similar to person uh, or sort of has similar tastes and behaves in the same way as somebody who earns less than two dollars a day within in India. And of course, there's wide variation within Latin America, just as there's wide variation within India. Now, what it also means is that there's a need, therefore, to go beyond localization or st providing stripped down versions from affluent uh, markets, right? In other words, you can't just say, oh, you know, I made something for $10 in the US. Uh, I will take out a few features and sell the same product for $2 in, say, India or in some other part of the world. It doesn't work that way, right? Because you are assuming that the basis, the design axioms on which that product was designed for North America or Europe or Japan is also valid for the BOP population. But people learn the hard way that that's not how it works, right? So what it instead calls for is a combination of asset exploitation, that is use of existing technologies with asset Seeking, that is technology creating basic research. So in other words, yes, on one hand, you can use certain things that you already know. Okay, there's no need to reinvent the wheel for everything. But at the same time, given the specific characteristics of this population you are trying to address, you do need to figure out a whole new set of things that you've so far been unaware of, right? You need to do some basic research, you need to understand this population and so on, and then combine your existing assets with new assets. Now, one of the reasons why the so-called BOP is extremely hard to design for is that those of you in marketing will know that when you're launching a new product, you typically rely on a lead user, right? who are reasonably familiar with the product and then you give them the next generation, you give them a prototype, they will tell you, uh, you know, what's good, what's not so good, try and incorporate that feedback and then only release the commercial version of the product. But 
The problem is, while in sort of well-developed markets, you have very well-defined lead users that you can stratify by age, you can say teenagers, middle-aged people, old people, etc., who have different approaches to using technology, lead users in the BOP segment are very hard to define, in large part because they've had very little exposure to technology at all in the first place, right? So what happens is you don't have a set of lead users that you can fall back on and test your products, right? It's not that easy. In order to overcome this problem, we came up with this notion of frugal innovation. And that was actually inspired by the term frugal engineering, which was first used by the former Nissan Renault CEO, Carlos Gossen. Now, frugal innovation is not only about cutting costs, but it must be, you must have sort of robust and easy to use products and services. It's about significantly improved products, processes, marketing or organizational methods that minimize the use of material and financial resources in the complete value chain. That is development, manufacturing, distribution, consumption and disposal with the objective of reducing the cost of ownership while fulfilling or even exceeding certain predefined criteria of acceptable quality standards. Now, what this sort of definition by two German professors uh, indicates is that frugal innovation is far from easy. There are, it, there are a lot of demands made on it, right? So to meet such sort of demanding standards, frugal innovation must draw on diverse sources of explicit and tacit knowledge about the lives and circumstances that have so far merited little attention. So far, the BOP has been ignored. Nobody cared for the poor. Suddenly, you want them to sit up and say, hey, we'll be consumers. That's not going to happen. So what it has meant is the need for research, design, and production locations in the global south for learning by interacting. So we are moving now uh, you know, to learning by interacting, where you're actually interacting very closely with the consumer and this is a big jump from the learning by doing that the Koreans and the Taiwanese had practiced successfully in the 1960s and 70s. Times have changed. So our innovation policies and approaches have to change. Now India is sort of a very important site for frugal innovation for a number of reasons. Uh, because you know India is first of all at 1.2 billion people with, with, with uh, 17 national languages and 512 other languages. It's a very diverse country socially and culturally. And at least about 40% of our population lives in conditions of poverty and illiteracy amidst inadequate infrastructure. So in one sense, it's a great sight. But that alone is not enough because there are many parts of the world that are poor. But what makes India unique is the pool of technical skills that is available to de design and deploy ICTs to address the challenges of the BOP population. And this, the existence of this pool of po the, the skills has been proven with the success of the software industry. Furthermore, India is, you know, it's the sort of the world's largest democracy. We are a flawed democracy, but we're still the world's largest, right? India is sort of has a thriving civil society with a range of NGOs, non-governmental organizations, which try to compensate for state inadequate provision of social and physical infrastructure. So you see NGOs working in the area of medical care, health, you know, education, and so on and so forth. And what they do really is, from the point of view of firms, they provide last mile connectivity to BOP markets, because NGOs work very closely with the, the underprivileged sections of society. The government, for its part, uh, you know, there's been a glow, has been sort of pushing this sort of inclusiveness agenda, right, for the last 10 years. And as part of that, it modified the Companies Act in 2013 and mandated that firms spend at least 2% of their net profits on activities explicitly identified by a corporate social responsibility policy. Right? So you essentially have to spend 2% of profits on, this applies to only firms of a certain size, but nevertheless, uh, they say, they've been told you have to spend uh, on CSR, 
and this CSR must be towards social upliftment. It can't be just another means of pushing your own products. State policy is sort of further incentivized firms to deploy the skills in India with the knowledge of that, and, and the knowledge of that can come from working with NGOs, right? And it sort of forced firms to say, okay, now let's turn to NGOs so that we are able to sort of gain a better idea of the kinds of products and services that we can, uh, uh, that we can provide the underserved. So while working with sort of CSR on one hand, it also, and, and, and the CSR sort of activities are primarily meant for uh, social upliftment, it also gives firms an understanding and insight into some of the things that that segment of the population might need, right? So it allows them on one hand to do social good, but on the other hand to also gain insights uh, into developing products and services that that, that, that the, sort of the, the BOP population will need. Now, because of these sort of change relationships, what you actually see is, uh, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you look at how sort of firms and sort of uh, NGOs interact, you see there's a very hard line. So typically donors would come to a school or a hospital previously, just write a big check and walk away. So if you go to a school, you know, this is taken from a school outside Bangalore, you find some very, very well-known names like Cisco and Digital and 3M and all these big companies, they have already made a donation. But you know, this is on the basis of somebody's whim. More recently, however, you see the blurring of boundaries. So you see, for instance, here on the left, the very top, Intel Foundation and Intel Bangalore. One is the CSR wing, another is the company itself. Then you see Cisco Foundation, Cisco Networks, Microsoft Research, um, uh, you see MIT Media Lab, the National University of Singapore, the University of Agricultural Sciences, ASHA Foundation USA. So you see the coming together of NGOs, firms, the government, uh, the Tamil Nadu government, the government of Karnataka, which are all sort of states within the country, uh, coming together to work collectively to solve the problems. This is again a manifestation of blurred boundaries to address the needs of the underprivileged. Now, let me sort of give you a couple of examples here, right? And this is I'll, I'll, the, the, the first example that I'll start off with is uh, Microsoft Research and the multi-point mouse, right? Now, Microsoft Research established MSR, or Microsoft established Microsoft Research, MSR, um, in Bangalore in 2005. And this center had this sort of unique technology for emerging markets group to address local needs by working with external partners, including NGOs and governments. Now, if you look at it, Microsoft Research uh, is located in about 13 parts of the world, uh, has 13 labs across the world. But India is the only location where they have a technology for emerging markets group. They also have other sort of computer science and engineering groups. Um, like in their other labs across the world. But this group, the Technology for Emerging Markets group, which includes sociologists, anthropologists, and people like that, is unique to India and to the center in Bangalore. Now, one of the challenges that they sort of decided to address about, this is almost a decade ago, was, you know, in a country where you have a very high student to PC ratio, right? In other words, you have far more students than PCs. The idea of a personal computer is meaningless because everything is, you know, you have 20 people running after a single computer. So that's not personal, right? Especially in schools. Because of affordability, government schools don't have the money and so on. So in order to sort of in, uh, improve or increase interactivity for all children huddled around a PC, Microsoft Research came up with a multi-point mouse or multiple mice with multiple cursors attached to a single machine, thus enabling at least half a dozen students or children to share a PC. And I'll show you a photograph in a minute in the next slide. Right? Essentially, for all of us who use a PC, whether it's a laptop PC or whatever, 
you have a mouse that there's one mouse to the uh, to the machine and then you move it around and then you sort of use it as you see fit or as necessary but what they did was they essentially said what if many many kids can actually have access to this so that you share that resource right now multi point mouse goes beyond cost savings a study showed that learning outcomes from competitive and collaborative lessons are as effective with a single pc per child in other words uh, they did research after designing this multi point mouse and they found out that more than just the cost saving of saying let's say instead of giving six children six different pcs you allow them to share the machine more than just cost savings the ability to work together improves learning outcomes right this is studies done by psychologists and anthropologists now bill gates refers to the design of such products and services for the unique needs of poorer or less affluent countries as creative capitalism right now um here it is now if you see the photograph on the left on the top you see this one kid who has the cursor uh, in his hand and children around him standing and saying you do this you do this and they all sort of egging him along and cheering him along right and the others are just or they you know this girl is simply watching because she can't do anything with the laptop but on the other hand with a with a multi point mouse you see all these four kids having a mouse and sharing the same machine so what this allows them to do is to play games together do some kind of learning together and interestingly enough right this innovation traveled even to the us to their poorer inner city neighborhoods not because students there lack access to pcs but because of the gains from collaborative learning that this kind of innovation from a pre-existing technology can offer right and in the case of this particular school and you know where actually microsoft came up with this idea these are actually poorly funded government schools and so the the, the government sort of had earlier approached a non-profit agency to run the schools on its behalf and so microsoft then started with working with this non-profit organization so really what happens is that you have a government school run by a non-profit for which this sort of new innovation is developed by a multinational company private sector not for profit sector and the public sector once again a case of blurred boundaries and sort of learning by interacting and seeing how kids use computers in order to develop innovations for them I'll give you another example uh, in the area of health. Uh, There's a big uh, non-profit called World Health Partners um, uh, in the in the northern state of sort of Bihar, where it is, which is actually India's poorest state. Physical isolation, weak public health infrastructure, and poor regulation in many parts of rural India force uh, uh, people to develop uh, depend on private practitioners. So. the people who need public health care the most are the ones who end up spending the most amount of money on private doctors and private medical care which is very tragic and many of these sort of so called private doctors are really quacks they are neither qualified nor certified to provide treatment right and they basically take illiterate rural people for a ride now like i said the lack of health insurance mean high out of pocket expenses which also inhibits the adoption of cost effective preventive care measures right so your nutrition is bad your uh, you know and so on and so forth so those sorts of you know preventive care is also not possible because you are not able to afford those steps and your health insurance is also limited to non existent so what happened was this ngo that's world health partners designed a telemedicine program that relies on existing social and economic infrastructures local market forces and new medical and communication technologies to scale up and to be cost effective so they said we'll work with the existing network we won't do anything new but we'll just bring in this sort of new technologies and we'll sort of reorganize the entire network of medical care so what the program does it provides health and family planning services through branded internet based healthcare service franchises which are linked to central medical facilities in urban areas 
staffed by doctors. So these internet-based health service franchises are often run by people who have no medical knowledge, right? But what they are now do is that because they connected through the internet, they call up a doctor in a major city at a major hospital and get the necessary advice. So like I will show you in a photograph in the next slide, the patient sits in front of the camera. The person who runs the franchise asks certain questions and they have a discussion with the doctor and then the doctor tells them, you know, what steps to take, what should be done next, what medicines, etc. Now the franchisee can initiate a service by calling the central facility. Now the rural provider facilitates diagnosis between the doctor and the patient, he mediates, he or she, using a remote diagnostic tool comprised of a computer with internet connection and a webcam, which is also designed to collect basic data such as blood pressure, heart rate, and pulse, right? So all the basic medical parameters are collected using this diagnostic tool. So here you see uh, the lady on the right is the patient. The lady on the left is the franchisee. She is not a doctor, but you can see in front of them a PC, a camera, a printer. And what happens is the franchisee calls the hospital. She mediates between the doctor there and this patient, finds out what's wrong. Then they come up with the sort of the diagnostic, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, recommendations. And see, for instance, here, some of these, uh, the, the, the diagnosis is often printed out, right? And given to the person. But of course, the patient may be illiterate. So what happens is that you also have to then figure out how to get medicines or uh, reports from pathology labs. Suppose you need a blood test. Suppose you need some other kind of test. So in order to do that, in the rural areas, they've also established these mobile um, diagnostic tests and mobile pharmacies. So which will come at specified times to the villages. And if you're a patient, you actually share your, you give the diagnosis to the person who will then come back, take your test if necessary, and then come back either the next day or whenever, give you back the results of the test, give you the medicines. And then once you're done with your treatment, you go back to the franchise and then you again discuss with the doctor. So essentially without breaking the rural social networks, right? Uh, and uh, without breaking sort of the local sort of, uh, what shall I say, uh, opportunities, economic opportunities that people have, this NGO has managed to refashion healthcare delivery, right? The, the interesting thing here, the, 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 the internet franchises are called Sky. That's the brand name here. The, what's important is to understand that for those of us who are from more educated urban backgrounds, the use of you know, quacks, that is people who are neither certified nor licensed to be, to, uh, to be a part of this kind of treatment is something that's almost shocking. But whether we like it or not, in many parts of rural India, and I know in many other parts of the world too, these local quacks are the people that the locals will trust, right? There's a long held social relationship. So if you don't include, include them in this process of healthcare delivery, the whole effort might be doomed. So you have this sort of, the, so what the really the, 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 the NGO did was to incorporate them. So you have clinics that are, like I said, complemented by a network of reliable pathology laboratories, which are connected to local pharmacies so that patients get test results and their medicines in one location instead of traveling long distances to the laboratory to collect results. The service added motorcycle delivery of medicines to remote areas as last mile provision. Right? Now, the uh, network uh, exists, uh, networking existing rural healthcare providers, including the unqualified people, ensures a service built on established trust, while rural providers reinforce legitimacy and branding through the network and improve the quality of healthcare service. So for a person who's also a quack to say, oh, I'm a part of this brand, it also puts some pressure on him or her to deliver, uh, to, to deliver better quality service, right? So it works sort of both ways for the patient and for the franchising. Now the services are mostly subsidized 
for the population because it's relatively poor, either by the government, the state of Bihar, or by other donors such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, and so on. Um, and the, the, the Gates Foundation in particular focuses on patients with tuberculosis, diarrhea, and pneumonia, because in that part of the country, those are the most, um, sort of the, 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 the diseases that take the most toll on uh, the lives of people. Now, the program started in 2008 and reached 2 million rural residents by 2011. By January 2014, its network had 600 health centers, 4,700 care providers, 35 clinics, 21 diagnostic centers, 10,000 pharmacies, um, uh, and all connected to 30 plus doctors around the country. By 2014, a pilot project was also launched in Kenya with 18 facilities and 100 mobile providers. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about both the Microsoft, uh, uh, the, the multiple mouse example, and this case, which is actually the World Health Partners, the Rural Health Franchises case, is that what we're witnessing today is a slight change in the direction of innovation flows, right? About how we now think about innovation. Earlier, it used to be that you know, innovations, you know, you look at the, the, the graph on the top left, right? You know, innovations would come from the US, they'd be produced locally, and then after some time when production stabilized, when domestic markets were met, production would move to international markets, primarily places like Europe, right? And uh, production would take place there to meet the uh, local uh, needs. And it would move to sort of less developed or you know, less affluent countries only much, much later. To the extent that any production moved there at all, it was only to take care of uh, low wage production. There was not much consumption itself there, right? And, but this is now starting to change, right? Innovations that, you know, uh, you know uh, the, 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 in, in, in both the cases that we had here, the multi-point mouse, and the World Health Partners case, innovations are taken to other countries with similar problems, including to the US, as in the multi-point mouse example. A phenomenon uh, that we broadly refer to as now reverse innovation. That is, it changes the historical direction of innovation flows that Raymond Vernon, uh, who, was once, who was a professor of uh, business at Harvard University, once described. So you have a situation where we typically rely on new technologies, new innovation, new products and services to come from the advanced industrial countries, the US, Europe, uh, uh, Japan. But now, given the size of the markets, given the unique nature of problems that we see in the global south, these and the increasing availability of skills also, we see that increasingly, you know, we are also generating you know, new products, new, uh, new, new, new processes, new innovations, and ultimately new technologies, right, to serve the world, and that the world is now becoming a much more interesting place with technologies and all these ideas flowing back and forth across different parts of the world, you know, true globalization, if you will, rather than merely sort of trickling down from the advanced industrial countries. And some concluding thoughts. Ultimately, see, the, the goal of technological change and innovation is productivity improvement and improving the standards of living in a society. Others, it's really of no use. Now, technological change is a necessary but not sufficient condition for innovation. Yes, we need technology, but it is ultimately the diffusion of technology that leads to innovation. And as we see in these examples of Microsoft research or, you know, even in the case of the Internet, and uh, you know the case of open source software, many many social actors actually influence that process, the process of diffusion, right? So technology is one thing, diffusion is something else, and that is how we get innovation. Innovation is about many ways in which actors use technology in their lives. It is multi-scalar, right? Cutting across organizations and sectors, and thus the need for policy support. We need to make sure that ideas are kept flowing. We cannot keep them locked up. So the key to innovation is the free flow of ideas so that different actors are able to combine and recombine them in different ways, right? So with that, I think 
uh, the presentation comes to an end. Thank you so much for your attention and time. And I look forward to being able to discuss some of these ideas with you uh, at a time that uh, Andrea will probably determine, and I'll stay in touch with her. Uh, good luck, and thank you for uh, listening to me.